Hello and welcome to VIAR 120, Appreciation of the Visual Arts. My name is James Tansel and I will be your instructor. This is Unit 1, The Language of Visual Experience. Lesson 1, The Nature of Art and Creativity. The nature of art and creativity establishes the tone of the text and this entire course. This lesson sets up categories for discussions in the visual arts by defining art and discussing its various functions and media explorations. This lesson also focuses on the unique human trait of creativity and distinguishes between looking and seeing as a strategy to better understand the value of art in our lives. The objectives for this lesson are to describe art as a means of visual expression using different media and forms, show human creativity as an inherent trait that inspires the production of art, demonstrate the diverse intellectual, cultural, and skills backgrounds of artists, distinguish form and meaning in visual analysis, and to define the terms representational, abstract, non-representational, and iconography used to discuss art. The topics we'll be covering in this lesson are what is art, what is creativity, trained and untrained artists, art and reality, representational art, abstract art, non-representational art, looking and seeing, form and content, seeing and responding to form, and iconography. You will also find your vocabulary for every lesson located in the PowerPoint presentation. The first image we'll be looking at is from Janet Eckelman. This is her Secret is Patience from 2009. It's about 100 uh, feet high by 100 feet wide. It is made out of polyester fiber twine and rope. This is probably a good image to start off with just to show you that art can exist in many different forms. This is a conceptual piece. The uh, artist had chosen the cactus flower shape to symbolize the Arizona uh, desert uh, over the city of Phoenix. So we'll be seeing more conceptual pieces as we go. Next thing to kind of ask yourself is what is art? Why is it difficult to come up with a simple and complete definition of art? Now even though we're going to try to define this as best we can as your text does, uh, please remember, everyone kind of has their own e definition and experience of what art is. So, even though we try to find this as much as we can, it will vary from person to person. So, here we have some important vocabulary. According to your book, a work of art is the visual expressions of an idea or experience formed with skill through the use of a medium. Now, uh, the medium is a, uh, another vocabulary word. Medium is defined as the materials and techniques used to make art. The plural of medium is media, so not to be confused when we talk about television and newspapers and such. Uh, it's a slightly different definition. Next vocabulary is the arts, art forms such as music, dance, theater, literature, and the visual arts. And the visual arts are defined as, in your text, as art forms including drawing, painting, sculpture, film, and architecture. It's kind of hard to put one standard definition into what is creativity, so your text does its best job by associating a bunch of different things together to come up with one more of a concept of what creativity is. There is associating, which is the ability to make connections across seemingly unrelated fields, questioning, persistently challenging the status quo, asking why things function as they do now, and how or why they might be changed, observing, intently watching the world around without judgment in search of new insights or ways of operating, networking, being willing to interact with others and learn from them even if their views are radically different or their competencies seem unrelated and experimenting, exploring new possibilities by trying them out, building models, and taking them apart for further improvement. Most of these examples can be applied to art as well as other things in life. Uh, creativity is not bound just to the art field. It can be associated with business, with uh, sports, and with science. Many different things. In discussing what is creativity, 
Sometimes the simplest ideas are the most successful. Uh, here's an image by Robin Road. He got game from 2000. A simple little idea re uh, enacting a, a basketball move by imitating a film strip, just taking several different pictures and different poses and positions as if the person's flying through this imaginary space to this cartoony, chalky basket. Very simple idea, but straight put. And sometimes you don't need to overdo something to achieve success in an artistic image. Prevalence of Ritual Tidings from 1967. It is a photo montage and a collage. Uh, just to give you a few definitions, a collage is a work made by gluing various materials on a flat surface, and a photo montage is the process of combining parts of various photographs into one photograph. Uh, the piece we're looking at right now is Rocket to the Moon from 1971. Very symbolic piece, kind of a, if you look closely at it up in the upper right hand corner, you see a rocket ship going to the moon, but yet you see the kind of urban elements down on the bottom, basically symbolizing the differences between um, different types of Americans during the uh, 60s. Now for the most part, to be a successful artist, you should try to train yourself, although this is not always the case throughout time. There have been artists who learn how to do things on their own and establish themselves without any type of academic background. They just kind of came upon it that way, but in modern times, we uh, do refer to these artists as untrained artists. Untrained artists can fall into a couple different categories. Folk artists and outsider artists. Sometimes they can also be known as naive artists. This is from Sabatino Rodeo. This is the uh, Nuestro Pueblo from Watts, California, otherwise known as the Watts Towers. Uh, this is another individual who had little to no artistic training whatsoever and just felt compelled for about 35 years to just start building things into uh, all sorts of directions. He used bed frames, metal pipes, held together with uh, steel reinforcing rods, mesh, mortar, and uh, also some smaller details that were uh, kind of glass items for mosaics. As we see in this uh, detail of the enclosing wall, uh, these were built from uh, roughly 1921 to 1954. It's now a historical landmark in California. In this slide, we have several different detailed shots of the Watts Towers that my wife and I took ourselves when we took a trip out to Los Angeles several years ago. You can see all the different uh, things that uh, he incorporated into the uh, design, be it the wire, the concrete, the little tile pieces that are like mosaics, broken glass, and other such things. They also span a very long period of uh, advertising. If you look in the upper right hand corner you can see some Welch's uh, glasses. Also we saw some Clorox bottles and other things that were uh, from long long ago embedded into the concrete This is from James Hampton. This is the throne of the third heaven of the nation's millennium general assembly. Um, what's interesting about Mr. Hampton is that he did not have any artistic training and over 14 years between 1950 and 1964 he took various items from work. He was a janitor and he slowly started assembling this project right here covering items in gold leaf and in silver leaf he believed that jesus was coming soon and he needed a place to sit on uh, what's nice about this is it now exists in the smithsonian institution this work of outside art almost could use its own category called the unknown artist who is found amongst a little over a thousand uh, other similar sculptures of varying small sizes in a pile of trash in Philadelphia by an art student. Uh, the artist is unknown and is referred to as the Philadelphia Wireman. This is a retablo painting from 1915 meant to give thanks to God. Uh, this work of folk art 
is also under the untrained artist category. These retablo paintings are found normally in Mexico and the American Southwest. Here we have a drawing by a child just at the age of three named Alana. This is called Grandma. Now most children do fall into the untrained artist category, but many of them will probably eventually be artists in training at a certain point when they're young and still wanting to discover new things. But most children at this age, three, will delve into a standard toolbox that's across the board for all kids, a different um, set of standards then when you get older and you start to make decisions, most children try to uh, represent things in a certain way. And uh, across the board, you'll be able to find children in many different locations that will all draw the same way when they're discovering how to communicate visually. As you've probably noticed by now, art comes in many different forms. But we do have three different ways of kind of generalizing where an artwork is coming from, so to say. Um, it's how it relates to the physical world. So we will be going over aspects of representational, abstract, and non-representational artworks. The first term we'll be going over under our art and reality category is representational art, which is sometimes called objective or figurative art. It depicts the appearance of things, meaning that if you look at a fairly accurately represented painting of a flower pot or a tennis shoe, maybe even a drawing, those would be called representational art. Objects in representational art are called subjects. The most real looking paintings are made in a style called trompe l'oeil, it's a French term. That's the first image we're going to be looking at next. Trompe l'oeil is French for fool the eye. Most of these works have a almost photographic-like quality. This is uh, from William Harnett, A Smoke Backstage from 1877. And just to let you know, when you see an assembly of items like this that are painted or drawn, we call that in the art world a still life. This is a... Uh, another painting that's a representational image but it plays with you a little bit as one can see this is a painting of a pipe but the phrase at the bottom says this is not a pipe the artist René Magritte was a painter that was heavily involved with the surrealist movement during the uh, 1920s and 30s it is very common for the surrealist to juxtapose put two kind of opposite things next to each other to mess with your heads a little bit we will be revisiting René Magritte again later towards the end of the semester and we'll cover surrealism a little bit before and along the way. This work by Ray Beldner is a direct response to the painting we just looked at. This is not a pipe from René Magritte. Ray Beldner's work is called This is Definitely Not a Pipe. It is from 2000. It has a uh, pop sensibility to it meaning that it's responding to the consumer cramming down your throats that you may get sometimes with certain art images and the fact that art can be sold for millions and millions of dollars. This is basically saying, well, if art can sell for that much money, why isn't it just made out of money? The next term under art and reality is abstract art. Abstraction means to extract the essence of an object or an idea. Abstract art can be works of art that have no reference at all to natural objects, or it can be works that depict natural objects in simplified, distorted, or exaggerated ways. Much of the tribal arts that come out of Africa and Oceania revolve around the abstraction of the human form. This can be seen in this chief's stool, which was made in the late 19th, early 20th century. We're going to learn a little bit later when we're going over the uh, earliest forms of art that uh, abstraction is uh, one thing that the uh, humans kind of came to 
meaning that they started off doing things kind of naturalistic at first and then uh, went to abstraction. These next few examples we're going to be looking at from Teo van Doesburg should really drive the idea of abstraction home. We'll see a few different variations in how far it can go. So what we have here is a loose kind of gestural drawing, an abstraction of a cow. If you look closely, we have some subdividing of the certain sections of the cow with geometric shapes. Here you can see how van Doesburg took those basic sketchy elements and started refining everything. Now beyond the geometric shapes that we're going to see here, notice that he's also used some particular shading to kind of define the value of the work. Hasn't completely gotten into color yet. In this next version of the cow composition, Van Doesburg pushes the abstraction a little bit further uh, by also adding color and refining the shapes that were laid out in the previous version. That was also done in a sketchier fashion. This is a little more refined with all the paint. Even though this is further abstracted, when we look at the past two versions, there's a sense of familiarity between all three of these. So the abstraction, you're kind of used to the fact that this is being represented as a cow, and it's kind of recognized as some type of animal form. This is the final example of the cow composition that we'll be looking at from Theo van Doesburg. In this particular version, the cow has been fully abstracted to the point where it would be pretty much unrecognizable unless you're familiar with the previous ones that we got a chance to look at. The legs, the tail, everything has been stripped down to basically its essence. The last term we'll be going over under the art and reality category is non-representational art, which is sometimes called non-objective or non-figurative art. Non-representational art presents visual forms with no specific references to anything outside themselves. Sometimes non-representational art can cross over into uh, conceptual art, where sometimes you're meant to get a feeling uh, from a painting or get a certain mood. Uh, this is a example of non-representational art by Alma Woodsy Thomas. It's a painting uh, titled Grey Night Phenomenon from 1972. Hopefully this image won't be too confusing because there are a few different things going on in here. We have some carved abstract sculptures but we're actually going to focus on the tuku tuku panels which are the uh, brightly colored woven textiles that you see in this image. They are by the Maori peoples of New Zealand woven about the uh, 1930s. These are a bit different in representation of what we uh, see um, that the carved sculptures are representing is some type of ancestor or tribal elder. Uh, the panels that are woven are actually not representing anything, although most of the time when people do research you can identify these patterns to uh, certain cultures, but other than that they aren't meant to uh, represent anything. Looking is the mechanical process in which we take things in visually. and Seeing is more of a higher level of perception meaning that when you look some at something you somehow like it has a visual appeal to you you're attracted to it somehow you know the reason for it maybe sometimes you don't but you know what you like when you see it here we have a quote from your text from artist Henri Matisse the best sums up the concepts behind looking and seeing to see is itself a creative operation requiring an effort Everything that we see in our daily life is more or less distorted by acquired habits, and this is perhaps more evident in an age like ours when cinema, posters, and magazine present us every day with a flood of ready-made images which are to the eye what prejudices are to the mind. The effort needed to see things without distortion takes something very like courage. Something interesting to be said about this comment is it was written about a hundred years ago, and it very much holds true today. This image here is a long exposure photograph from Edward Weston. It is Pepper number 30 from 1930. 
if we just look at this image, what comes up is a pepper. Plain and simple, what you can find in a grocery store, or perhaps in your garden. Now, Edward Weston saw something in this pepper that made him want to photograph it. It resembles an embrace. Some people can see that in the image, and some people can, and that's our perception of things, looking versus seeing. Our next category is form and content. Art communicates through both form and content. Form equals what we see, an identifiable shape, object, or figure. Content is the message or meaning of what we see. Some artworks have symbolic content. If so, the symbolic meaning of the work, the iconography, is based on traditional interpretations of the society, culture, religion, etc. Iconography, which relates to content, will be the last category we go over for Lesson 2. The next two images we'll be looking at have the same idea, but they're represented differently. This first sculpture is made of marble. It's from Auguste Rodin. It's titled The Kiss from 1886. This is a matter-of-fact representation of the human kiss. It's very literal and easily recognizable as to what the concept is. This sculpture is made of limestone. It's by Constantine Brancusi. It's also titled The Kiss. It's a little later from 1916. If you look closely, most of you will recognize that these are two abstracted human forms that are in embrace with their eyes and their mouths facing each other faces, separated by a simple space, a gap in the stone. But what's different about this, this is meant to be more about the idea of love, two becoming one. This is further reinforced by the fact that this is a solid block, and it's meant to look like one piece. So we can say that Rodin's work expresses the feelings of love, and that Brancusi's work expresses the idea of love. Some artists are known for responding to form. This is a painting by Georgia O'Keeffe. It's titled Jack in the Pulpit, number 5, from 1930. We will be covering Georgia O'Keeffe several times throughout this course. She's very well known for paintings of the New Mexico desert and of plant and flower forms. Sometimes she would zoom in on such a tiny portion of the flower that she was examining and painting that it would take on abstract qualities. So this is a response to the form of a flower. You don't necessarily have to see the whole entire flower, but you definitely get the idea that it's floral in nature. Iconography, which is the symbolic meaning of signs, subjects, and images. Now, iconography can get very complex if we think in modern times and what we worship. They can get into conceptual areas to where an icon can actually be an iPod or something. In this Peruvian painting, The Virgin of Carmel Saving Souls in Purgatory from the late 17th century, we have many examples of Christian iconography. At the top, we have God. Below him, there are angels. Below the angels, we have Mary, and so on. And on the lower left, we have the cross as a representation of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. We will be learning that at times using iconography like this is completely acceptable and embraced, and at other times it is completely outlawed and discouraged, and sometimes even destroyed. This particular sculpture from the 12th century embodies certain Buddhist and Asian traditions which can be identified through many different aspects in the sculpture, down to the uh, posture, the way he's holding his hands, his clothing, his jewelry, um, all of this is rich with iconographic tradition. Iconography is not only limited to uh, religious art, uh, many everyday things can have uh, iconography, as we see in this work of art by Alexis Smith. This is loaded with the iconography of the artist and of sports. Uh, regarding the artist, we have the painter's palette in the background and the comment, I am an artist, my art is assaulting people. And then the sports iconography can be found in the baseball bat, uh, the mascot, and the uh, boxing photograph in the background. 
So we are now at the end of lesson one, and I'd like to leave you with something interesting to think about. So I thought I'd finish this lesson off with a question to ponder about why we make art, why some people do, why some people don't, who exactly makes art, uh, do you have to be trained, is it a natural occurrence, which brings me to the slightly humorous moment. Uh, what you're looking at are images by two different animals. On the left we have a painting by a cat. Now the deal with paintings by cats is that they're mostly inspired by humans in the sense that probably some paint was put out and a canvas just for this cat to check its reaction of when it puts its paw in the paint and it drags it on the surface that something interesting happens and they might just have more fun than anything. Uh, but what's interesting about the elephant is the elephant has a little bit more understanding and purpose besides their paintings. Now they also sometimes are assisted by humans that they are given paintbrushes and a palette of paint is usually put out them with specific colors beforehand but uh, this is generally um, a very valid painting of a elephant having made a flower. They know how to represent items that they see.